Part two, choosing the proper business entity. The qualified small business stock exclusion. How startup shareholders get 10 million or more tax free. Each financial decision is not in a silo by itself. It has to be looked at and how it relates to something else in your plan. And most people are not looking at the big picture. The big picture. So we're going to talk right now. It's John Smallwood, certified financial planner, uh, president of Smallwood Wealth Management, uh, financial advisor, certified financial planner, 34 years, et cetera. Okay. And I'm having fun with this because this is really important. If you are a business owner and you are going to grow your business from, you know, from zero to a million in sales, a million in sales to 10 million, a million, 10 million to 100 million, you have potential and you want to get yourself in the right entity. And the entities based on tax code, tax law will change and modify over time. So it's a constant conversation that you kind of want to look at, right? So when you think about it, you can be, you're a business owner and there's pass-through entity and there's non-pass-through entity. And each one of those has different impacts on your thing. So what do I mean by pass-through entity? If I have a sole proprietorship, an S corporation, an LLC, a partnership, an LLC tax like a partnership, an LLC tax like an S corp, all the profits of that company flow through to my personal tax return based on the percentage of ownership that I have. That's passing through. A C corporation is going to not be a pass through entity. It's going to be retained by the corporation. Okay. Now I want you to stop and think for a second. I have an entity or I'm going to start an entity or I'm redesigning my current business. Need a little drink there. Um, I'm redesigning my current business. I got new partners coming on. I've got capital coming on. What is our intent for this business? This is going to be a business that's going to be, perhaps I'm doing multi, multi franchises, right? I'm going to buy, you know, 400 Chick-fil-A's, right? I don't know if you can get 400 Chick-fil-A's. I'm sure somebody does, right? Um, I'm going to buy complimentary franchises. I'm going to take, you know, you see it all the time. You got a wax center, you got a massage center, you've got a chiropractic center, you've got a stretch lab, you've got all these different things. Like you could be a guy just combining and saying, oh, in this community, I'm going to have four of these. You have a, a great business idea. You, whatever it is, right? That's not important, but you're now sitting here, should I be a sole proprietor? Should I be a partnership? Should I be a limited partnership? Should I be a limited liability company? Should I be a professional corporation? Should I be a C corporation? And what do most people do? Go online, create an entity. Because somebody said I should be an LLC. Or somebody said I should be a C corp. Or it doesn't really matter. You're just going to be a sole, a sole proprietorship. Now, when you're making the decision on entity, liability protection should be an important part of this, right? It should be. A sole proprietorship does not have any elements of liability protection. Where a LLC, you know, a limited partnership, a uh, S corporation, those have liability limits that if the company's getting sued, your personal assets are not going to be entangled in it unless you commingle and you personally guarantee stuff. Okay. Which happens way too often. Um, but sometimes you have to like rents, leases, you know, stuff like that. I see people all the time. They have a big corporation. 
four or five locations and they personally, the landlords are making them personally guarantee because they're smart. All right. And you got a 10 year lease with all kinds of renewables that you're stuck in and the business fails. And now you've personally guaranteed that. Whoa, we don't want to do that. Okay. So it's easier now not to do that because commercial real estate's got, you know, they got pressure. So now you can make better deals. You're renegotiating your lease. Do you have it? You, you know, these are things you need to think about, right? So, but the entity, if I'm, let's just, I'm going to pretend for a moment, I'm going to create a couple of different um, avatars, for lack of a better word, right? So four people are getting together and we're going to create this online brand, apparel company, uh, product, you know, cool little light, um, you know, maybe a pillow, you know, something that's really, really cool. Not so, I'm just kidding. But it's, you know, the widget. And we, our goal is to get this to, you know, uh, a SaaS program, right? Our, get a certain amount of users and then we're going to sell it. We're going to sell it quickly. So, under the current tax law, there is C corporations. If that's what I'm thinking about, and let's say during this point where I'm not going to, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be taking a lot of money out of the company during this time frame because I'm gonna be plowing all my stuff back into the company because that's the most important investment that I'm gonna make. A lot of times when you're talking to an investment advisor, they're like, oh, you gotta take money out but we're in growth mode. If we don't, if we take the money out, we're not reinvesting back in the business, then we're not going to get the returns on the, on the business. So where are you getting the biggest return on equity is you want to be reinvesting. You want to take this business from zero to a hundred million and then sell it for whatever you can sell it for. Right. And each industry and each business is going to trade on a different function of the EBITDA, you know, the, net profit. It could be like, if you're in the alarm business, it could be, you know, how many people do you have on a monthly, you know, how many units do you have? Those things trade for a multiple. If you're in, you know, you've got an online phone business, those things trade for a certain multiple. It's based upon, you know, the data, you know, why is, why is, why do the, you know, the cell phone man, you know, the cell phone, services give you the phones for free because the money's in the recurring revenue stream and that's what makes it valuable okay i'm just giving you different thoughts and different mindsets here right so you know your business might be heavy heavy in depreciation of equipment right because you've got all different types of depreciation going on the life of these products you got to really look at your taxation and how it's going to be taxed right but the mindset of this thing really comes down to is if the goal of us getting together is to take something from zero to a hundred and then sell it and I have your traditional LLC or an S corp, which might be good. It's a great benefit, but it may not be appropriate for what we're talking about. Section 1202 of the tax code basically allows a C corporation shareholders of a C corporation to get $10 million on a sale tax-free tax-free. So if the corporation is purchased, I see a lot of people organized as C corporations and nobody will buy them. Nobody will buy the C corporation because they're afraid of the embedded liability in it. So they'll buy the assets of the company. And when you buy the assets of the company, you don't get the $10 million exemption. So you got to really understand like, what are you like? Who's buying you in the future? Who is a, who is a buyer? How are they going to buy you? And you need to understand how you're going to structure it. If you take it public, that, going to qualify for it. That could qualify for it. You, you, you really need to get together with tax people to really understand that, right? So 
if my goal is to sell and to sell quickly, I might want to reorganize or establish the company in the form of a C corporation. Now, this is a new tax law, right? This is something that came out in 2019. It had not been around. It's been here. Is it, you know, it's making people very, very wealthy. And if there's four partners and you sell it for 40 million, it's 10 million each, right? So it's a very valuable thing. I mean, think about it. If capital gain rates are currently at 20%, that's huge, right? It's huge. But, you know, when the tax law sunsets, those capital gain rates will go back to the higher numbers and, and then people pay between zero to half a million. They're paying 15 and above like a half a million or 500. I don't know the exact number. Let me see if I can grab my cheat sheet here and look at it. Married, filing joint, 583. You got 20% capital gain rate. Under that, it's 15. So, you know, do you sell your company under an installment sale? So you spread it out over a 10-year period. So you're realizing the gain over 10 years or five years. Lots of different ways to do it because who's buying you, okay? Now, the entity choice has a ripple effect that's going to go through it based on your current taxation. So if you're a company that's a startup that's basically plowing money back into the company, you're not going to take a lot of income out of it because it's all about growth. C Corp could be a perfect example because you're going to sell it. If you're, if you're a very profitable company and you're going to have lots of retained earnings, the C Corporation may not be the right element for you because the retained earnings, if I, let's say I own a corporation and it profits, from, you know, have a million dollars worth of profit in it. That profit is retained earnings, which the C corporation is going to pay about 34% federal tax plus potentially state level tax, depending on where the entity is and where the income is rising from. And now that money becomes retained earnings. So roughly 600,000 is now sitting in my retained earnings thing. And then I take that out as a dividend, and that qualified dividend is taxed at 15%. But if you think about it, that's like a 45% tax rate. That doesn't really make a lot of sense. Now, to contrast that, if I was an S corporation, that same million dollars of profit could benefit from qualified business income deduction and what's known as bait tax in certain states. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Like, what the heck is that? Okay. But the bait tax is a way that you can pay your, 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 your state level taxes through the corporation and take a deduction for it. Most people, when I, when I say that, they like, what? I, I didn't know that. And there's like 36 states that actually can do it. New Jersey's one of the, you know, one of the first ones that did it because we were, losing so many people when the salt deductions went out, right? So if you live in New Jersey and you're not, if you don't, and you're a business owner, you're not taking bait, you're not cutting bait. I'm just kidding. You need to really, you need to really rethink what's going on there. But I digress. The, this, so I have this company that's going to be very profitable. C Corp, 34% tax plus state. Now it's retained earnings. Now the assets that are retained earnings are subject to creditors of that corporation. Not necessarily a great thing, but I now take the dividend. I expose that to a qualified dividend, which would be 15% to 20% its capital gain tax rate, right? So you're exposing yourself potentially to higher taxes. Now to contrast, S Corporation, LLC tax like an S corporation, I take, or even any pastor entity, I take that million dollars out. It gets taxed at me and I get a qualified business income deduction, which could be 20% of that. So instead of paying tax on a million, I'm paying tax on 800 K. Okay. If, if that 
qualified business income deduction, 199A. QBI, qualified business income deduction, boils down to there's a couple different factors, but it's either it's 50% of your W-2 wages in the corporation. So if you have no wages in the corporation, you're not going to get any QBI deduction or 20% of the profit. And then there are limitations and caps that are put on specific industries, such as the investment business, such as legal. Some of them do not benefit from qualified business income if your income is over 400000 But that same million dollars, let's say the person owns a business that benefits from full qualified business income deduction. So the million comes out, you're paying tax at on 800 at 37% federally. Whether you leave it in the corporation or not, because all profits go through. Is that better than 34 and then 15 or 20 on the back end? That sounds better. Okay. Now, the, the entity choice, you also have to be considerate of Medicare tax, right? So certain entities expose all your money to self-employment tax and then Medicare tax. And you want to minimize the impact of those taxes as well. Pre the Tax Cuts Jobs Act of 2017, you know, and still post, if I own an S corporation and I pay myself a $200,000 salary and I take a million dollar profit, that million dollar profit still pays whatever the tax is from a federal standpoint, but that's not subject to Medicare tax. That's extremely powerful. That's 3.25, you know, 1.52 employer, personal, and business. It's 3.52. So every 100K, it's worth 3,500, a million dollars. So I see people with the exact opposite. They have, they pay themselves a million dollar salary because somebody said so, exposing it all, you know, creating all this additional layers of tax where if they paid themselves just a $200,000 salary, and the rest was bonus, they avoided that entire Medicare tax on that. It's pretty powerful, right? So I'm hitting key points here. There's so much nuance, there's so much detail in this that you don't wanna just run with this and say, oh, I gotta go do a C Corp or an S Corp. You really need to get together with people that really understand what you're trying to accomplish and then how they boil it back into the right strategy, right? So. What we're focused on is that the pass-through entity, this bait tax, this pass-through tax, this business alternative income tax is something that I'm finding, not all, but a ton of people when I say it, they don't even know what I'm talking about. So there's a really cool document that you could search it and it's put out by the AICPA, which last I checked, they were a pretty good, you know, organization. I'm kidding, but they are, they're a great one. Okay. It's the accounting organization stays with an acted or proposed pass, pass through entity level tax. It's 36 States, according to this document, which was updated April 16th of 24. I'm not screencasting this probably should be, but I, what does the pass-through entity mean? This is, you know, New Jersey that started in 2020. New York started in 21. Illinois started in 21. California started in 21. So I own a pass-through entity. What does that mean? The profits pass through to my personal tax return, regardless of whether I take them in or out. If I leave them in the corporation, I'm still getting taxed on it. That's a pass through entity. S Corp, LLC, partnership, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, C Corp, not. So if you're not a C Corp, that's what this is. So what that bait tax in New Jersey allows us to do, and when the, when the Tax Cuts and Job Acts came out in 2017, they limited the state and local income tax deduction to $10,000, which is known as SALT deduction. 
which means if I live in a high tax state such as New Jersey and I'm making a million dollars, I'm paying about a hundred thousand dollars in you know, New Jersey income tax. I might live in a stupid house with stupid real estate taxes. I'm joking because it's beautiful, but like real estate taxes in New Jersey are not cheap. Um, you have a house that's worth, you know, $800,000. You're paying 18, 20, $30,000 in, in real estate taxes. In some cases I've seen it as high as 50, $60,000. Okay. And you're only getting a deduction for $10,000. And people are like up in arms about it this can't be. And people were fleeing these high tax states. And then the high tax states said, oh, we got to stop people from leaving. So we need to give them an incentive. And those that are in the know basically said, oh, shit, what does this mean? You're telling me that if I pay, I get to pay my New Jersey taxes, that should be on my personal tax return from the corporation. So I want to go back to the million dollar profit just a, a minute ago before the QBI deduction. So let's say that I have a million dollar profit. I owe a hundred thousand dollars of my state level taxes. If I make my estimated tax payments from outside from personally, like you're probably doing then I'm missing this D deduction. The state of New Jersey says, go on this site, hit, sign up for it, qualify for it, and pay that same $25,000 a quarter tax from your corporate account. And we're going to give you a federal deduction for that. You're going to get, so instead of having to pay tax on 100, you're now paying tax on 900. And now you're still getting qualified business income deduction. So that, let's say it's 20%. So you were paying, so you said, yeah, I got 100,000, so a million down by the 100. So now you got 900, you got 20%, of that, that's 180. So you're at 720,000 that you're paying 37% tax on. Top bracket. That's awesome compared to a million. And if you put it through W 2 and payroll, you're not really getting that deduction. So you got to get really strategic. Then there's reasonable compensation. You know, you can't pay yourself nothing. You have to pay yourself reasonable compensation. But my point of this is you are a business owner and the most important thing you should be doing is understanding what entity should I have and what are my, what are my, what are the things I have that I'm taking advantage of that I or what, am, what, are the th what are the tax benefits I have in my corporation that I'm taking advantage of that I'm not taking advantage of? There's accelerated depreciation. There's bonus depreciation. There's, there's all kinds of things that you could be doing in your corporation to knock the taxes down in the corporation to make it very valuable. That's why we're business owners. No, it's not why we're business owners. We're business owners because we want to grow our businesses and have this wonderful thing. But the reality is I'm a business owner. I get to design the way I want to pay taxes based upon what I am trying to achieve. If I'm looking at this and saying I'm a 40 year old business owner and I've got, you know, two kids that are in their teens that, Hey, they look like they're destined to come into the family business. And I join my father, I should be setting up that entity and my tax structure for a perpetual go back to the, the beat it concept from the earlier podcast in a beat it. And, you know, make, take in actions. Now, why am I so adamant about this? I believe in something called opportunity cost. You do too. You may not have ever heard of it. Opportunity cost is a measure in economics of typically measuring two different investments. Side by side, one makes eight, one makes five, same, the same, the same risk. There's a 3% per year in perpetuity opportunity cost on that. But I want to dig deeper. Everything that I, every tax dollar that I waste, not only did I lose the tax dollar, I've lost the future value of what those tax dollars could be in my future. And if I pay, let's say that I'm a business owner and I'm super successful and I could have this you know, I'm supposed to pay 
the tax code allows me, and there's many other deductions that I'm not even talking about in this, right? But let's say the tax code, you know, good planning brings me down to 120, but I pay 140 for some reason because I did, I missed a couple of deductions. It's 20K extra taxes per year for the next 30, 40 years. What's my opportunity cost? A ton, right? So what we want to do is you want to look at, as a business owner, you have a personal, what we call a wealth curve, right? That personal wealth curve, and then you have your business wealth curve, right? Are you, everything that happens in the business ends up on your personal return. Are you maximizing the benefits out of the corporation to get the least amount of taxable income into your plan? Secondly, am I, in my personal plan, am I maximizing all the tax benefits that I have there to reduce that taxation? And if I'm doing that, it's optimized. Most people don't have it optimized. Most people, when they jump into the planning process and they say, yeah, Smallwood, I heard about you. I want to go through your planning process, blah, 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 blah. And they say, oh, you know, you got a fee to do the plan and blah, blah, blah. That's expensive. And I say, relative to what? To the money that's leaking out of your plan? Like, we'll find so much money and strategies leaking out of your plan throughout the entire plan, personally and professionally. Can't guarantee that's going to happen. But most people find exponential value in what we're doing. But the conversation about your wealth and where you want to go and how you want to enjoy it and how you want to structure it is the most important part of the process. So I want you to stop. I want you to think for a second. And I kind of wanted you to wrap this together in the concept. So I'm a business owner. I want to grow my business. I might want to sell it. I might want to have it as a family business. Get clear on that. I want to grow this business. I want to enjoy my lifestyle. I want to protect my money. You should be using a beat it. You should be benefiting from the proper entity. You should be utilizing 199A for as long as it's here. If you don't utilize it for the next two years, this year and next year, and it sunsets, there's going to be a new tax law. If you run the sunset and you are a business owner and you're making the amount of money that I'm talking about, if not more, the move from 2025 to 2026 is staggering when you look at it. There's strategies and ideas you need to start thinking about. Because every tax law, I used to dread it. You know, I'd be five, six years in the business. There was like a ton of estate tax laws and, you know, income tax laws. I'm like, oh my God, how do you keep up with this? And the reality is every time there's a tax law change, it's, there's always opportunities inside of there to get more strategic and, and better. That's what keeps me coming back. So if you're listening to this, and you really want to have a really good conversation about your business, your personal wealth, where it's going, how you minimize the tax taxation, how you maximize the asset protection, how you reduce your risk, reduce your fees and costs over time, and pass the maximum to your family. If you want those things, you should reach out to us. If you want the opposite of that, you shouldn't reach out to us, right? If you want to pay more taxes and you want to have more risk, and you want to have less retirement income and you want to pass less to your family and have less asset protection, then you should continue doing what you're doing. Thank you. I'm having fun. I'm serious, but I'm having fun. Okay. So this is really important. I want you to really think through this. There's some tools that you can access on our YouTube channel. Um, there's videos. I have a history on the, on the YouTube channel. I have an old video that I did probably seven or eight years ago called the history of the U.S. marginal tax bracket. Taxes were temporary, you know, started as a temporary tax in 1913, I believe, to refund the Spanish-American War debt or some other debt, and they were temporary. And once that debt was going to be paid, it was going to be gone. Then it went up to 90% for a period of 21 years. Watch the video. Make some comments. Have a wonderful day, guys. Thank you.